Exactly one year ago today, um, I had my first look at the documents that came to be known as the Twitter files. We've learned a lot since then. When Michael and I testified before uh, the good people of this committee in March, we both talked about how this isn't a partisan issue at all, uh, despite the fact that it's been uh, repeatedly described as a right-wing conspiracy theory or, or a right-wing fantasy. Uh, we found evidence of suppression of movements on both sides, uh, including leftist movements like the Yellow Vests, uh, parties like the Green Party, organizations like Consortium Magazine. Just this week, Michael and I reported on the group um, that he re talked about, the CTI League, and in those documents we found evidence of monitoring uh, groups like the Democratic Socialists of America, hashtags like Healthcare for All. The nature of censorship programs is that they tend to expand in all directions, and these uh, programs already have. As someone who voted for Democrats his whole life and who got his ideas about speech issues from people like Senator Frank Church, Paul Wellstone, and Dennis Kucinich, I believe also that there's a less obvious but more important reason that people across the spectrum should care about this issue. The former executive director of the ACLU, Ira Glasser, once explained to a group of students why he didn't support hate speech codes on campuses. The problem, he said, wasn't the speech. The, the, the problem was, quote, who gets to decide what's hateful? Who gets to decide what to ban? Because, quote, most of the time, it ain't you. <laughs> the story that came out in the Twitter files, and for which more evidence surfaced in both the Missouri v. Biden lawsuit and this committee's Facebook files releases and in the CTI League documents, they all speak directly uh, to Ira Glasser's concerns. There's been a dramatic shift in attitudes about speech in this country, and many politicians now clearly believe the bulk of Americans can't be trusted to digest information on their own. This mindset imagines that if we see one clip from RT, we'll stop being patriots, that once exposed to hate speech, we'll become bigots ourselves automatically, that if we read even one Donald Trump tweet, we'll become insurrectionists. Having come to this conclusion, the government agencies like the DHS and the FBI and the quasi-private agencies uh, who do anti-disinformation work have taken upon themselves the paternalistic responsibility to sort out for us what is and is not safe. While they see great danger in allowing others to read controversial material, it's taken for granted that they themselves will be immune to the dangers of speech. This leads to the one inescapable question about these new anti-disinformation programs that is never discussed, but needs to be. Who does this work? Stanford's Election Integrity Project helpfully made a graphic showing the quote-unquote external stakeholders involved in their content review operation. It showed four columns, government, civil society, platforms, and media. There's one group that's conspicuously absent from that list. People, ordinary people. Whether America continues the informal sub-Rosa censorship system uh, we've seen in the, Twitter in the Twitter files or the Facebook files, or whether it formally adopts something like Europe's draconian New Digital Services Act, it's already abundantly clear who won't be involved in this kind of work. There'll be no dock workers doing content flagging, no poor people from inner city neighborhoods, no single moms pulling multiple waitressing jobs, no immigrant store owners or Uber drivers, these programs will always feature a tiny, rarefied sliver of affluent professional class Americans censoring a huge and ever-expanding pool of everyone else. Take away the highfalutin talk about countering hate and reducing harm, and any disinformation is just a bluntly elitist gatekeeping exercise. If you prefer to think in progressive terms, it's class war. If one small demographic over here has broad control over the whole speech landscape and a great big one over there has no control whatsoever, it follows that one of those groups will end up with more political power than the other. Which one is the, is the winner? To paraphrase Ira Glasser, it probably ain't yours. It isn't just one side or the other that will lose if these programs are allowed to continue. It's pretty much everyone, which is why these programs must be defunded before it's too late.